Hey there, this is Seth Schaefer from Team Just Cause Robotics, and today's video will be about a brand new 3 pound beetle weight robot I'm building, which I've decided to call Shrapnel Mine. This project is sponsored in part by Sendicut Send via discount code, more on them later. I'll get into the reasoning for the name in a bit, but if you're familiar with the phrase, then you probably already know what I'm getting at. In this video, I'll cover the thought process I went through to get from an idea in my head to an actual design that I could 3D print and prototype as an initial proof of concept. I'm planning to do a whole bunch of videos on this project to cover all aspects of the process, so make sure that you're subscribed if you haven't already. My analytics say that's more than two-thirds of you watching right now. I'd also love to hear in the comments what parts of the design process do you want to hear about the most? Conceptualization I did a live stream a couple of weeks back where I spent more than three hours working on the CAD design for this new bot, having begun it with an already worked out mechanism for how the robot should work. I also discussed in detail what the general goal for this robot is and how I came up with it. Here's a clip from that. What my idea is, is that I realized that a lot of people now in the Beetleway class for Norwalk Havoc are making plans for Starchild, because Starchild has this thwacking like overhead spinner, and that is probably the most powerful top attack weapon in the class right now. If you want your robot to drive, and it has wheels, the wheels need to touch the ground. Which basically means every single robot has a severe limitation on how much material they can have between their wheel axles and the floor. So in other words, if you're fighting a saw robot, you can put on special armor that's just to fight a saw robot on top of your bot. But you can't put it on the bottom of your bot because then your wheels don't touch the floor. So my idea is I use a saw that'll be attached to this motor. I drive and pin somebody against a wall. I use this four bar mechanism that acts basically like P1's front hinge flipper to not have to have the bottom of their robot. The bottom of their robot is level to the floor. I pick them up and then I push them against the wall. So now the bottom of their robot is exposed and then I just shove the saw straight into it. So that way, I can cut through the bottom of a robot. So that's my idea for defeating most of like the meta vertical spinner bots. Um, and I don't know if it'll work at all, but I think it'll be cool to try. And I think I can make this mechanism light enough that and like durable enough that it, in theory, can work. So the name Shrapnel Mine is simply a reference to a German weapon used in World War I, which was a form of landmine that would pop up out of the ground and then explode shooting shrapnel everywhere around it. The idea with this robot is that it attacks from the ground and pushes robots up against a wall to be able to attack their undersides. Now, towards the end of the livestream, I started to have my doubts about how this particular 4-bar mechanism might work in real life, especially because there seemed to be no good way of working a servo into the mechanism to actually drive it. Plus, having the front hinged flipper set up with a fixed hinge point higher up meant the entire mechanism would be pretty weak. As anyone who's ever snapped a stick in half will know, the further away two loading points are, the easier it is to bend or break. Just try bending a pen or pencil by hand from the very ends, and then put your hands as close as possible and try it again. A shorter pencil is much more difficult to bend, because you can't get any real leverage. Researching parts Because this project was going to be ambitious already, I wanted to use as much off-the-shelf hardware as possible. Before starting this project, I had a servo on hand I thought I might be able to use, but I didn't want to limit myself and detriment the outcome. I looked up different linear actuators and servos and did some napkin math. I wasn't sure at first if I wanted to base the mechanism on the rotating motion of a gear motor or a servo, or the sliding linear action of a linear actuator. However, I realized pretty quickly a suitable off-the-shelf linear actuator didn't really exist. At this weight class, they're all just too slow, too big, and too heavy. I already wanted to use a servo because it has the advantage of built-in positional control circuitry and a stupid high gear ratio the equivalent of probably more than 200 to 1, in an already lightweight package. This 35 kilogram centimeter servo, which I've settled on for instance, is under 70 grams by itself, which is about 2.5 ounces, but it can deliver up to 35 kilogram centimeters of torque or around 30 pound force inches of torque, which means a 3 inch long saw arm could be forced into an opponent with 10 pounds of linear force, or a 2 inch arm with 15 pounds, etc. More importantly, it's fast, able to move its full range of motion in under a second, 
These are available with 180 and 270 degree versions, but they move about 30 degrees less than advertised. Now I had something that could rotate to a prescribed angle on command, but I needed a way to move the saw into a bot at the same time that the front angled forwards. The mechanism. When designing a mechanism, it's easiest to break the problem down into its simplest parts. One trick I was taught in college is that when you want to solve a problem, the first step is framing it in a way that doesn't imply the answer, or lock you into one path. In its simplest form, the goal of this mechanism is to rotate the front of the bot between 45 and 60 degrees, and rotate the saw arm close to 180 degrees at the same time. To accomplish this with just one servo would be far more weight efficient, which is how my original 4-bar concept came to be. However, after staring at it on stream for 3 hours, I started to think, there has to be a simpler answer to this problem. There are tons of ways to get linear motion from rotational motion that have fewer joints and pivots. One concept we all know from geometry and trigonometry is how a point on a circle moves as the circle rotates. Draw a point on any rotating circle and you'll see that when the point moves to the left side or the right side, it's mostly moving up and down, but when it's at the top or the bottom of the circle, it's mostly moving left or right. I realized this could be used not only to couple the motion of the saw arm and the front hinge, but to create an artificial delay or an offset between those movements. If the initial left-right motion causes the front hinge to move forward, and then up and down movement makes the saw come forward, that would be a really great way of making sure that my front is angled forwards before the saw comes into play. After making a bunch of 2D sketches and properly constraining points on those, I was able to simulate this motion and play with the ratios of lengths and radii until arriving at what I felt might be good enough to commit to a 3D representation, and I scaled it to match what I might be able to build in real life. I found some versions of the 35kg servo made for robotic joints which conveniently have two axle supports mating to plates with M3 threaded holes. I got to work figuring out what the shortest arm I could use would be based on the saw diameter of 2.25 inches that I had picked out, which given the 28mm motor that would be inside of it seemed like a good size to be able to cut deep. After I had that length, I scaled the other lengths to match and began designing. In CAD, I wanted to keep in mind what parts are made in what ways. Some may be laser cut by send cut send, some may be 3D printed, some may be machined. I also needed the material in mind too. A plastic part can't simply substitute for a metal part of the same thickness. The original arm bracket is 2mm thick crappy aluminum. I say crappy because all the strongest alloys like 6061 or 7075 won't bend without cracking, so this is likely a 3000 or 5000 series alloy that's bendable but much weaker. In my latest revision, I'm replacing that with 7mm thick plastic, which will either be a flexible TPU or a more rigid alloy 910 nylon. There are other considerations too. Metal on metal friction is very material and smoothness dependent, and it's better to use a bushing or bearing between rotating surfaces than having them scrape on each other directly. 3D printed parts can be threaded, with larger fasteners, but those threads are much weaker than a steel hex knight would be. Right now I'm focusing on just this one mechanism, but I also know it'll ultimately be part of a larger whole robot, so some thought into how the rest of it will be created is also important. The front forks need to extend below the base plate to scrape the floor, but also stick up past the saw when it's all the way back to protect it. I decided the front forks will be AR500 steel, probably 3 8 inch thick, and I figured I could make all of the pivots a quarter inch diameter, 3 8 inch long shoulder bolts that are about a dollar each could then be used for all of the rotating joints, and I could use bushings that are only about 60 cents each to reduce friction. I used the same diameter shoulder bolts in Draconid and Mini Mulcher, so I already have the taps and nuts for those threads on hand. By threading the bolt into one side of the link, I only have the head sticking out the other side rather than a head on one side and a nut sticking out on the other, making everything a bit more compact and clean. The threads on these shoulder bolts are also conveniently 3 8 inch long. The saw stack up. One of the trickier bits to figure out was the saw. I wanted to attach it directly to the weapon motor, but there are lots of ways to do that. I quickly realized simply gluing it to the motor can wasn't a good option. I also contemplated using an M5 lock nut threaded onto the motor shaft like I do with Mini Mulcher for its gear that drives the weapon, and I have a hex imprinted into the gear. This both transfers torque and, as long as the motor spins to tighten the nut, prevents it from sliding off of the shaft. But the lock nuts that came with the drone motors that I bought are flanged. They won't work because they won't fit into a hex depression. And of course two of them have left-handed threads because drones. I had bought a set of four 2205 drone motors to use in later versions of Mini Mulcher for the weapon because the originals are discontinued, and I realized that it would be great to be able to use those here because of the ventilation pattern in the top of the can. Rather than praying glue or Loctite would hold a 0.1 inch thin lip onto the can, I could 3D print a part that interlocks with those vent cutouts and transfer all of the torque easily to the saw. 
That way, I can instead rely on having a precise, tiny gap between the bearing supporting the motor shaft on one end and a 3D printed saw hub and spacer on the other in order to prevent the saw from sliding off, instead of having to hold it on with a nut. This will allow the motor to spin freely while still transferring all of its torque to the saw, but the saw can't slide off in either direction. Rapid Prototyping Through the process of rapid prototyping, I could test out a ton of ideas with really quick, cheap and dirty prototypes and refine elements as I go once I prove out certain other ones. Hobby 3D printers like my Prusa Mark 3S are unbelievable for this sort of thing. I had to solve several different problems both in CAD and in my head. How will each part be made? What materials and manufacturing methods can I utilize? Each part is shaped to some degree based on whether it has to be 3D printed ultimately, CNC machined, or laser cut by this project's sponsor, Send Cut Send. Send Cut Send only allows 2D shapes, but you can always post-process the parts to make them into 3D geometries, clean up bores for bearings or bushings, countersink, or simply tap threads into the holes. I've already gone through three or four iterations of most of the parts I've designed for the servo arm mechanism and the saw support, and the links that will attach to the front forks. Send Cut Send, as I've mentioned before many times, is a laser cutting and now also CNC routing service, which offers unparalleled access to accurately made engineering grade parts for any hobby or professional project. They will cut a 2D shape out of a huge range of materials, everything from plastic and carbon fiber to titanium, aluminum, or my personal favorite, AR500 ballistic target steel. I'm planning to use AR500 for the front forks on this bot and probably 6061 or 7075 aluminum for the links. I'm also using their service for the saws that I'll be arming the robot with. I ordered five custom designed saws to be cut for only around $6 a piece already, and that's before they even gave me the 70% discount code to use for other parts of this project. Full disclosure, they haven't paid me anything, nor do they have any oversight on these videos. They're just great people and have sponsored many a BattleBots team, so I wanted to help return the favor by partnering with them on this project and giving them a bit of exposure, and hopefully we can work together more in the future. That's all I have for you today. If you liked this video, make sure to hit like. And if you want to see more like this, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon. The next video on this project will focus on insert topic here, so make sure you're subscribed so you won't miss it. Sorry I've had such a long delay in production here. Moving's been pretty involved, and I also just got my second Pfizer dose yesterday so I can be sure to be safe at the May 15th Norwalk event. If you haven't already been vaccinated or have concerns about vaccine safety, make sure to ask your doctor or another medical professional instead of random people on the internet. And as always, thanks for watching.